So welcome back. Sorry, the break was rather short, but I hope you managed to get a drink at least or something. Um, so yes, as Orish just mentioned, we'll now be shifting our attention to focus on a large, large scale marine infrastructure project, which is led by our next speaker, Greg Delorn. Um, so this project is just starting up um, and Greg will tell us more about that, but this will be an interesting comparison so we can see how um, how to build up resilience for a larger uh, community or system. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and invite uh, Greg to start sharing his and whilst he's doing so I will uh, introduce him. So uh, Greg is an internationally recognized consultant, teacher, speaker and writer specializing in sustainable economic development and public private partnerships for green cities and smart cities. He is the managing director and co-founder of Deep Blue Institute and CEO and co-founder of the Urban Innovation Exchange and technology partnerships director for the Seasteading Institute. Today, Greg will speak to us about the multi-scale regenerative marine infrastructure projects that Deep Blue Institute is leading in the Bayou region, and will explain how the transition to a blue economy is so critical. We'll also learn about Deep Blue Institute's three-legged approach to building a blue economy, and how this will allow for the Bayou region to become a global leader in the deployment and scaling of environmentally regenerative technology. So over to Greg, and thank you for joining us. Okay, you can hear me? Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Greg. Okay, wonderful. Uh, all right, very wonderful to be here. Um, so, uh, first of all, yeah, I just want to thank, uh, thank Ideal Spaces and Flora and Ulrich for the tremendous opportunity to be here uh, participating in the Biennale. Uh, this is uh, uh, wonderful opportunity to talk a little bit about what we're doing in New Orleans, uh, also reconnecting with some uh, wonderful memories of working in Italy and being in Venice. I actually was at the 1998 uh, Venice Biennale uh, helping out to set up as a, uh, as a graduate student, set up the exhibits at the uh, Arsenale uh, back then. So uh, wonderful to be back in this capacity and to be able to talk about the work of Deep Blue Institute here in New Orleans and uh, what we're hoping to accomplish and hopefully relevant to some of the, the things that the other speakers have been talking about in terms of these different types of interacting systems and, and here with these uh, large systems. So uh, diving in, uh, what we're working on here is in concept, uh, what we call a Nouveau Ne Parish on the Blue Tech Delta or a, a reborn parish and in Louisiana uh, they instead of having counties like the rest of the United States we actually have parishes uh, and each of those parishes has their own unique culture and history and particularly those along the coast are some of the most at-risk communities in the country and arguably in the world and very similar to what we uh, see in parts of Italy and around Venice and the lagoon there. So uh, I think some relevant parallels between some at-risk communities uh, locally there, but also around the world. And that's one of the things that we're trying to accomplish here with the Deep Blue Institute, working with the local community is reimagining the future of the Louisiana estuary with these uh, components of regenerative marine infrastructure, touching on disaster risk reduction, marine habitat restoration and cultural preservation and with models and ideas that then can be applied to not just the Louisiana estuary region, but other parts of the world where these were at risk communities in the form of island nations, Delta communities and other low lying coastal areas are facing real existential threats in terms of the future of climate change and sea level rise. In the case of Louisiana, Louisiana is losing about a football pitch of land every hour and a half. Uh, the map there shows from a, a regional study, the 50 year land loss under a medium environmental scenario. And many, many of these areas are, are highly populated or have these small communities, again, with unique cultural aspects of 
uh, uh, French Cajun language, uh, Zydeco and other types of music, uh, festivals and uh, unique cultural manifestations that include escaped slave communities that were established 150 or 200 years ago, uh, Native Americans, as well as other sorts of unique cross sections. So uh, in this case, we're looking at an area that but uh, 2,250 square miles that uh, could be lost over the next 50 years. Uh, and to be, to be, to be perfectly frank, uh, probably will be lost. So I think one of the unique things about the work that we're talking about here is uh, the key word is adaptation. Uh, so many of the things that we're talking about cannot be changed at this point. This is the new normal for the Gulf Coast. So this was uh, three weeks after, uh, in 2005, three weeks after Katrina hit, um, 50 levees and flood walls around New Orleans uh, that had failed with, with Hurricane Katrina. And again, these levees were breached with Hurricane Rita. So that was, that was 2005. Uh, the 16 years to the day uh, this year, uh, we, we were hit with Hurricane Ida on August 29th. And uh, here in New Orleans right now, uh, we're still seeing recovery efforts. Uh, New Orleans was not directly hit, but the outlying communities, particularly to the southwest of New Orleans, were heavily hit to the point that you have Lafourche Parish, uh, where cities like Cutoff and Morgan City are located, where the power grid was completely destroyed. It cannot be repaired. So what does that mean in terms of rebuilding uh, resilient infrastructure and rethinking what infrastructure and resilient communities look like in these areas moving forward in the age of the climate change uh, crisis. So a lot of the history of this area started with another natural disaster back in 1927, uh, which was called the greatest peacetime calamity in the history of the co uh, country by the uh, then President Hoover uh, that inundated 26,000 square miles in 107 counties in seven states and really changed the face of river management and the management of the entire delta. It was essentially the watershed moment where they decided to channel the, the Mississippi. So uh, in response to that, the, the Mississippi was uh, enclosed with levees uh, all the way to out into the Gulf. And what that did, among other things, was stop the sediment cycle and essentially put us in a pattern where we needed to maintain those levees and the land behind the levees was forever changed. And that's when things like the process of subsidence began. And that in part is what is exacerbating our challenges now is not only are we dealing with things like king tides and storm surges and heavier rainfall, but also subsidence that is, uh, that is uh, lowering the land behind the levees. And when flooding does happen, that flooding is exacerbated. So in general, some of the challenges we're looking at are coastal communities uh, disappearing along with the cultural heritage that I mentioned, this increased flooding, storm damage, and the, dis, dis, uh, the economic dislocation that goes with this uh, from the destruction and from people having to move. Land loss is exacerbated by that subsidence that I mentioned, the storm, storm surges, and the interruption of the Mississippi's uh, annual sediment deposit cycle, which uh, we're now starting to look at in terms of opening up the levees and trying to restore that sediment cycle. We also, at a, at, an, at a watershed scale, we have nitrogen and phosphorus pollution coming down from the entire Mississippi watershed all the way up to Minnesota and um, Missouri and Illinois and those places that's destroying lakes, rivers, and delta ecosystems. And that's happening around the world, but particularly uh, is uh, impacting the Gulf when all of that nitrogen, uh, nitrates and phosphates get to the Gulf and cause these harmful algae blooms. So there's over 400 of these worldwide and essentially they are hypoxic dead zones which completely kill all of the plant and animal matter in, in the area where the harmful algae, algae blooms occur. In 2019, uh, it was estimated that the Howard Fly algae bloom in the Gulf was almost 8,000 square miles uh, large. And uh, that's, that's in America, that's as, as big as two of our small Northeastern states. And then from that, we have tremendous uh, food loss on the, so this is impacting a lot of different systems, including food systems. So uh, over uh, uh, 
235,000 tons annually of uh, seafood and other uh, losses that are occurring uh, from these sorts of hypoxic events. So Louisiana obviously is very aware of this. Uh, they started to develop policy and planning tools and methods and projects. So one of the key ones is Louisiana's Comprehensive Master Plan for Sustainable Coasts. Uh, which came into being in uh, in 2017 and looks at all these different potential ways of uh, dealing with the the issues using flood protection, natural processes, uh, restoration of coastal habitats, uh, preservation of cultural heritage, and trying to uh, preserve and grow what a working coast means. So this is some of the background and uh, context that the Deep Blue Institute came into in uh, uh, last year, really. We started, we started exploring work here in 2019 and we moved the Institute here last year in 2020 and now have been working on site for about a year. And uh, that's some of the, the lessons learned we'll be talking about today. All of this is very much in line with the United Nations disaster risk reduction uh, um, that's going on. And uh, what that does is recognize that there's no such thing as a natural disaster, only natural hazard. So with the disaster risk reduction work that the UN is doing, it's looking to reduce these uh, the damage caused by natural hazards like earthquakes, floods, droughts, cyclones, uh, through ethic prevention and uh, looking at these different methods of uh, greater investment, education, awareness, better urban planning, community participation, scientific and local knowledge, risk assessment, coordination, good governments, early warning systems, sustainable development, and contingency plans. So uh, all of this contributing to the idea of resilient communities, resilient cities, and, and uh, giving opportunities to connect the world and find common ground in different communities around the world around these sorts of issues. So at the Deep Blue Institute, we're taking this, this ecosystem approach, combining ecology, economy, and ecos ecosystems, natural ecosystems, uh, in, in to bring together ideas of economy and industry, environmental health, education training, cultural history, uh, science and technology, and government policy, and work with different public and private entities in public-private partnerships uh, and also bringing to bear networks from around the region, around the country, and around the world, and certainly interested uh, today in particular to be sharing with and hearing from our colleagues around the world that are working on similar ideas and concepts and setting up dialogue and exchange on these uh, solution sets and ways of dealing with these issues. So uh, working with the ideal spaces, uh, concepts of different types of evolution, type one evolution and type two evolution. So type one evolution, and I'm not sure uh, Flora and Ulrich, how much you all have gotten into the details of uh, those different types of evolution, but the, the type one evolution being more the, the natural systems ongoing, uh, more of the same uh, sorts of planetary systems that uh, we experience in large time span, shifting from let's say a, uh, an agricultural society to an industrial society, but then also at a planetary level, looking at planetary shifts in uh, natural shifts in climate or uh, seasonal shifts, et cetera, as compared to a type two, which is more of a gestalt, uh, more recent, or uh, in many cases, and certainly things that I'll be touching on, uh, disruptive or anthropomorphic impacts that are accelerating uh, geomorphic changes. So in the case uh, of the Louisiana Delta, these type one are again, these natural systems, planetary scale, you know, what, what are the traditional uh, uh, patterns of sediment deposit that have been going on for a long time, uh, planetary cycles of uh, heating and cooling, uh, the development of the, of the biome and other uh, environmental systems that that are happening in the Delta region and really Delta regions all over the world. Uh, and then the ocean currents and atmospheric currents that are influencing regional climate and uh, also impacting things like the longevity of ice caps, et cetera. This type two in the Louisiana environment, uh, in particular, is the anthropomorphic impacts of climate change, 
uh, disruption of the riparian sediment cycles through the construction of the levees on the Mississippi, the subsidence that that's occurred, and then with the destruction uh, or loss of the habitats along the coastal area uh, in the form of the death of cypress groves, uh, the saltwater infiltration, either from uh, engineered infrastructure like canals that have been dug to uh, create access between the Mississippi River and the Gulf and the petroleum activities that go on there, uh, that these are all things that are destroying these, uh, these uh, coastal habitats and exactly exacerbating, again, things like saltwater infiltration, but also the bulwark of, uh, of barrier islands that protect the coast. Uh, the increased storm activity and the storm surges that, we, that I mentioned, those again are things that are being, uh, that are really undermining the, uh, the structural integrity of the coast, but then also creating these human disasters as well. And then uh, the accentuated tidal activity that's coming with climate change in the form of king tides and uh, storm surges. So uh, a lot of things that were happening anyway, but now are being accentuated by these human uh, interventions. So this is a, sort of an overall view of uh, what I'm gonna be getting into in detail, uh, looking at uh, the, the, specific, the specific areas of environmental impacts, economic impacts, and sociocultural impacts. But the general idea is that uh, this type two evolution uh, is exponentially accelerating the impacts of the more gradual and subtle type one evolution. So uh, the, the various things that I mentioned that are sort of happening that were, the world is a dynamic place. The world was changing, but it was, it was changing at a, if you will, a, a planetary rate. And it, that gives ecosystems time to adjust and to adapt and for uh, uh, vegetation to uh, evolve and all that sort of thing. With these, uh, these type two evolution elements, we are accelerating this, this rate of change and starting to exacerbate or trigger these, uh, these tipping points, these major changes, which include concepts or uh, things that are, that are already starting to happen, major ocean current shifts. Uh, um, at some point, we're going to hit a tipping point where plants actually start to uh, reduce the amount of CO2 that they're absorbing, which will drastically uh, exacerbate the CO2 issue in the uh, atmosphere. Polar ice cap loss that we're already seeing, which is reaching dangerous tipping points. And now even methane loss in the uh, uh, permafrost uh, areas of Siberia and the Arctic regions. So methane, as we know, one of the worst greenhouse gases. So all of these things are, for, in many cases, are things that at this point we really cannot stop. So uh, the reality is we need to be looking at the adaptation potential for that, the, these sorts of changes. So looking first at environmental factors, uh, the, the, the major, major one that we're uh, focused on here is that anthropomorphic climate change and how that is accelerating these fluvial changes in the river uh, that necessitating coastal and fluvial engineering and exacerbating unsustainable agricultural and, and fishery activities. So uh, in these diagrams, uh, basically what we're working with, and I've been working closely with Flora and Ulrich on this, is is uh, relatively trying to communicate with these arrows and these different interactions uh, graphically and hopefully clearly uh, the relative size or impact of something like anthropomorphic climate change with respect to uh, fluvial evolution, which is uh, more of that uh, a type one evolution, and then the coastal river engineering, which is happening in reaction to the combination of anthropomorphic climate change and uh, natural fluvial evolution, and then these unsustainable uh, agricultural and fishery uh, activities. So what are the different relative in, uh, interactions between those? Uh, I'm not going to go into every single one of these since we don't have that much time and we can also leave that for discussion. Uh, but uh, this, I understand this um, presentation will be available through Ulrich and Flora and uh, looking very forward to following up with uh, our colleagues on any specific issues that we want to get into. 
But again, general idea being how do these relative uh, elements and impacts and evolutions uh, relate to each other and how can we start to better understand them so as to uh, come up with solutions or develop strategies to react to that. And this really brings us to the work that Deep Blue Institute is uh, trying to do in Louisiana. So in, future, in a future scenario of environmental factors, how can regenerative blue technologies uh, have a different, uh, create a different future where things like unsustainable agricultural and fisheries become a much smar smaller element in um, more regenerative policies. The anthropomorphic climate change is something that we, we can't do a whole lot about at this point, uh, particularly as it relates to Delta areas. So the hope is that with the regenerative blue technologies and policies, we can better uh, control and uh, respond to, again, adapting. Ad adaptation is the key word running through our work, we can adapt to these anthropomorphic climate change. We can adapt to the coastal and rival engineering that, that in some cases need to happen in order to protect these communities uh, and respond to the, uh, uh, the, the fluvial evolution that's going on as well, but do this in a way that, uh, that creates a more regenerative, a more re resilient society and with that economic opportunities and socio-cultural preservation. So that's the particular, uh, the, 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 the potentially in the environmental aspect, looking at the economic impacts of what's going on here in Louisiana. Uh, again, the type, type one in terms of the economy in Louisiana is looking at these longer term global evolution of energy and marine industries international, uh, uh, internationally that are being internationally experienced around the world, but have their own unique uh, manifestation here. In particular, the fossil fuel industry is, is very important here and dominates along with tourism. Uh, shipping is very important here as well. And uh, all of these things are, are certainly impacting the Gulf area. Where, and then in type two, which includes also perhaps the most recent and dramatic of the impacts is the, the, the COVID-19 uh, impact on the local economy and the disruption that has had on the tourism industry. Uh, but uh, certainly there are other things going on that uh, with the new administration and the hope that there will be some uh, more uh, sustainable environmental policies that we can, can rely on. So again, this overview of the economic factors, currently oil and gas and tourism are really dominating. Uh, the local economy, uh, environmental management is also becoming an important part of what, what we're doing here. And then the agricultural, uh, agriculture and fisheries, which very much is related to the tourism industry in terms of the food culture here. But oil and gas is having a disproportionate impact on the environmental quality and on, uh, uh, as a result, on fisheries and agricultural activities. The uh, number five there, I think is particularly important that the two major economic drivers in the area, oil and gas and tourism are really at odds because uh, the oil and gas is, has a tendency to uh, disrupt or destroy some of the habitats and uh, disrupt the activities, particularly um, uh, nature tourism, ecotourism that uh, Louisiana is so well known for. So, Again, here in the economic factors, we're looking at how can environmental management, blue economy, and all of the different types of new blue technologies and ideas that Deep Blue Institute is trying to bring to Louisiana, things like clean energy and more sustainable agriculture and fisheries, how can all that be the, the new big driver in the economy of the area, reducing in the upper left there, the impact of oil and gas and creating economic opportunity with clean energy, uh, and, and supporting the tourism industry better with um, uh, healthy natural habitats for growing seafood and other sorts of things that's, that support the food culture and the ecotourism uh, culture. And then in the cultural impacts, again, uh, there are regional shifts that naturally happen all over the world in terms of people moving around, particularly in the United States, people are moving around for jobs and for shifts in the economy, there's growth and expansion, et cetera. But uh, in Louisiana, this, the cultural impacts 
are really more acute in terms of the loss of local communities and cultural uh, migration and displacement because of the inundation and destruction of coastal communities from storms, et cetera. So that's particularly painful in, in Louisiana. And again, something that Venice can relate to uh, in terms of uh, the impacts of tourism and too much tourism uh, concept in, in Venice, uh, turismo, terrorismo, that uh, uh, tourism actually can have very negative impacts on, on disrupting, destroying, and diluting the uh, cultural identity of, of the local area. So that's something else that Louisiana is dealing with, particularly in these areas that are experiencing physical disruptions to their, uh, to their world. So these cultural factors as they, the, as they currently stand, the current dynamics, is this regional sociocultural dislocation and disruption that in part is happening because of climate change, uh, but uh, also because of uh, impacts of the, uh, of the oil industry on which we're extremely uh, dependent, such that when uh, oil companies start to move away from the area, as they've done in various times throughout history and the last 100, 100, 150 years, that that becomes a huge impact on the local culture, the local economy and the impacts that that has on uh, creative culture and identity because of the economics of uh, the region and uh, on the general evolution of lifestyle as it relates to jobs and the ability of communities, stability of communities in the Gulf region that are dependent upon uh, uh, oil and gas jobs or tourism jobs. And when either of those industries falter, that really has a big impact. So. Uh, the, the national and global evolution of cultural uh, factors is, uh, as well as something that is going on here, but uh, uh, really, and, and I think particularly important for Louisiana and New Orleans because so many people feel a particular connection because of the, the jazz or the visits that they've made here, um, that there's an opportunity to create a better link between the the food and music and history that New Orleans has created and the place that it holds in a lot of people's hearts around the world. So that's certainly one of the things that we're thinking about at the Deep Blue Institute. So in terms of future dynamics, what we see as opportunity here is the, the adoption of a, a, a more uh, a regional, more regenerative lifestyle that reduces the dependency on oil and gas and tourism. Uh, and can really reinforce this creative cultural identity of food and music and festivals, et cetera, and can, re can also impact this dislocation that's uh, happening into, again, to a certain extent, inevitably happening in terms of these coastal communities that uh, with ideas that touch on even things like floating cities and floating infrastructure, but also aquaculture, mariculture, and new industries that can diversify the economy, that this gives the communities on the coast tools to uh, not only stay in place, but to have a sustainable lifestyle and to protect their culture. So again, as I, as I mentioned before, uh, the, the overall ideas with the work that we're doing is to reduce these type two uh, impacts on the local culture and economy, et cetera, and create a, a more adaptive approach to, to the uh, coastal resilience and uh, a, a brighter future for the coast, which right now is, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of reasons to, uh, to be afraid of, of uh, a, folks living in these communities, what their future could be in terms of economy and culture, et cetera. So diving down, we go to a, a deeper level. I'm gonna uh, spend a little bit of time looking at, specifically at the potential for blue technologies and policies in the area. Uh, and what can we do with blue tech and blue economy? And uh, that touches uh, particularly on things like regenerative off-grid energy, water and waste systems and infrastructure. Uh, also on integrated regional scale ecosystem services. So these are things like wastewater assimilation projects, which, which use municipal waste and create uh, a fertilizer, a liquid fertilizer that can be used to grow coastal wetlands and barrier islands and therefore protect the coast. But then also getting into more social systems like education and research policy oriented towards regenerative marine based initiatives. So that's where we get into engaging with public private partnerships with schools and regional government 
and then also robust expansion of entrepreneurship and industry diversification in blue technology. So that's bringing some of uh, Deep Blue Institutes and also UIX Global, another one of our organizations, work from the Bay Area and working with green and clean smart cities in the San Francisco uh, Bay Area and Silicon Valley area on the entrepreneur community incubation and acceleration of new technologies and bringing that sort of mindset and expanding those activities in the Gulf region so as to grow these activities. So this is kind of the big hope of, uh, and, and what we're trying to support here for, for the future dynamics of the regenerative blue economy and blue technology development in the region is a marine focused education and research activities uh, and how those can really support blue tech entrepreneurship, how it can support integrated regional, uh, regional ecosystem services in the form of these, uh, not only wastewater assimilation, but other sorts of habitat restoration and, and water quality uh, improvement, and then regenerative energy and water systems. So things like offshore wind uh, and blue energy and all sorts of things that can really revolutionize the blue economy and blue technology in the region. And in so doing also with number six there, uh, create a, a, an exchange relationship with other regions of the world that are facing these exact same issues. And when we think about uh, um, countries or communities like the Dutch, the Dutch 500 years ago or more developed flood control technologies, which for at least the last 300 years, they have been uh, marketing and, and uh, distributing around the world as an important exported set of uh, technologies and know-how. And that's something that Louisiana could do the same. And not only can Louisiana do this in the future with these sorts of regenerative marine infrastructure technologies and blue technologies, but also Louisiana has already done it in the past. So in the last century, with the oil and gas industry, if you went to the platforms of Siberia or uh, Norway or the Baltic Sea, the, the foremen or heads of the teams of roughnecks that are running the drilling platforms, et cetera, those were very often from Southern Texas, from Southern Louisiana. So not only were those technologies being exported from the Gulf region, but also the actual uh, uh, human resources and skills were being exported from here. So that's the big hope on what we can accomplish here. And uh, I can answer questions on all the ways that we're already getting started with that type of activity. But how that manifests in terms of our plan for engagement is with this Deep Blue Institute uh, eco solution space concept that uh, basically a series of different nonprofit and for profit activities. And particularly, we're focused on the bottom right there with these for profit activities that have to do with consulting, up, uh, consulting activities. Uh, advising and uh, uh, defining roadmaps for how to move forward with different types of uh, blue economy projects, uh, operation um, activities on things like wastewater assimilation or other sorts of infrastructure scale projects, and then helping out and designing various types of projects and how these sorts of for-profit activities can then support sectors in education, uh, ideation in the form of the, the Deep Blue Institute think tank, and then uh, moving around uh, to incubation and acceleration of new technologies, and then investment in startup technologies and, and attracting and growing local talent in the region and developing with the local universities like the University of New Orleans and perhaps Tulane and LSU, uh, developing uh, systems where we are uh, uh, activating local entrepreneurs in the blue economy and helping them to develop the, re the solution sets that the region can, can implement and scale uh, to protect the region, to protect the culture, to protect the coast, but then also to share those lessons learned with the rest of the world. So all of these, all of these pieces together uh, can also support and benefit from a, a large fund that would be a combination of for-profit venture and angel funding of new uh, technologies, but also nonprofit funding for the education and uh, research activities that in the education realm would even include K through 12 primary school, uh, community education and undergrad education, as well as research. So. This all goes towards a regional shift in culture, economy, ecology, 
and looking to the future and growing future generations in which this becomes the primary focus, the existential, facing the existential threat of how this region can develop its own solution sets and ultimately help the rest of the world by exporting those solution sets and ideas uh, and helping other island nations and coastal regions around the world. So these are some of the, the folks that we've already, I have been working with or starting to work with uh, longtime partners like the Buckminster Fuller Institute, uh, One Island Institute's working globally. Solar Heads of State is particularly focused on uh, renewable energy in the Caribbean area. Uh, Blue 21 is, a, is the Dutch uh, architectural firm with which we worked uh, previously on prototype projects for floating cities in French Polynesia. The Clean Tech Open is a uh, US-based but global, globally active clean tech accelerator incubator. Uh, Meeting of the Minds is a, uh, a smart cities oriented organization that's working globally around uh, IoT and uh, smart city systems. Pyramid Foods is part of uh, the, the uh, uh, food vertical of uh, uh, sustainable and regenerative aquaculture and mariculture, as well as land-based food systems. Comet Resources, a local engineering firm that is leading with leading the world really with technologies around wastewater assimilation and already has uh, uh, projects that have been active for 10 to 15 years. The Seasteading Institute we've worked with previously on the project I mentioned in French Polynesia, the floating cities, and they continue to support the idea of floating infrastructure and floating communities around the world. UNO is one of our key partners locally with their facility called The Beach, which is the UNO Research and Technology Campus um, on Lake Pontchartrain in New Orleans. And uh, we're very excited about uh, to continue to develop our relationship with uh, their, their facilities there. And then UX Global is our smart cities and uh, community engagement arm that is doing some work in, in Louisiana, but uh, previously is more focused on things again, like IoT, smart cities, and uh, uh, in innovation, innovation ecosystems for urban areas. So this, uh, for somebody like myself, who is a New Orleans native, uh, and just moved back last year to focus on these things and bring to bear my a previous global experience. Uh, that this is something that uh, the, you know. For us, the question is: if if not now, then when? If if not here, then where? And if not us, then who? And and really, in the context of our presentation today, uh, the who is everybody on this call and everybody who's interested in these sorts of uh, solution sets that that we need to be developing around the world so that. Uh, we, we can avoid these sorts of uh, disasters that you see. This is the where the the levee walls broke in 2005 for Katrina and devastated the city of New Orleans. And, and this is the future we're facing unless we can really come together as a community, as a nation, and as a global community to address these issues and develop the blue technologies and blue economy models uh, that can help us to adapt to uh, the realities of what, what is happening with the impacts of global change around the world. So I'll leave it there. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Dire anche per i nostri amici italiani che posso rispondere anche in italiano se ci sono le domande su questa presentazione. So uh, just saying that can also, uh, with my time in Italy, I can also respond in Italian, either offline or online to folks that may have some, uh, some questions on the presentation. Thank you very much. I guess some minor issues here. So let's start with the discussion. Thank you very much, Greg, for this very insightful contribution. My pleasure. So were you able to hear the presentation? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely fine. We could also see your slides. So everything went fine. I, I guess there are some minor issues at the pavilion in Venice. Can oh, okay. So All right. Well, uh, fine. With that, then um, uh, the, uh, I'll go uh, ahead. No. I have some discussion questions um, as part of the slides. So. Um, to get the discussion going. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions, but uh, these were some of the discussions that uh, we, discussions I think we talked about. Um, so 
thinking about what may be some of the engagement or, or opportunities for uh, collaboration around the world. Uh, sort of a big, big question that'd be interesting to hear uh, folks comment on is how do we build resilient global networks to support these sorts of uh, large regional scale innovation labs for coastal protection and community preservation. So that's really what we're trying to do here is create this sort of regional scale lab uh, activity and opportunity. Uh, and then also how do we exponentially accelerate coastal ad adaptation beyond the speed of government. So that really gets into the motivation for the public private partnerships and activating entrepreneurs and small businesses and corporations uh, at a private sector speed at a uh, entrepreneur speed, because certainly one of the issues here and around the world is uh, that government has a tendency to move too slowly to uh, uh, either with policy changes or with funding of projects, etc. So uh, at Deep Blue Institute, we really feel like that needs to happen from the private sector and in these partnerships. So uh, very interested and excited to hear what people might have to say about that. And then uh, for other, other folks from other parts of the world that are tuning in, what are the most uh, pressing technological needs facing your coastal uh, area or island community? Because uh, again, Deep Blue Institute, we want to be sort of a clearinghouse and a facilitator for the discussions of uh, what, what, can, what are the technologies that we can be, should be developing uh, to, to come up with these solution sets. Uh, it was a very, uh, it was a very interesting uh, contribution you had, since it was about large systems and uh, solutions, as you said, uh, can be, uh, as it can be exportable to other regions. The coastal regions, uh, as you addressed it, are the most endangered regions for the time being due to climate change. And first of all, we had to apologize as a way the technical problem here in the Biennale Pavilion, but. Now it's settled, I think. Uh, my first question is as a, uh, res, keeping in resume the questions you outlined. My first questions in resuming your questions is uh, speed, as a speed of change. Uh, what have been the major obstacles for a development towards uh, what you call the Blue economy a solution. Mm -hmm. According as uh, experiences. Huh? Yeah. So, um, like many areas, there are the established there are the established economic uh, activities, and as I uh, emphasized here, those incumbent industries are oil and gas, and then uh, tourism. So, uh, in, in the case of tourism, there's no fundamental. Uh, conflict between anything that uh, Deep Blue Institute wants to do and uh, in terms of diversification of the economy. But uh, the oil and, oil and gas industry here is, uh, has, has really been con controlling the economy and arguably sets up of uh, uh, um, a, if, if you will, not a very nice term, but a banana republic um, a dynamic where uh, the, the, the investment and the activities that go on here uh, are in many ways destructive to the environment. Uh, they are unsustainable in terms of uh, uh, labor force and uh, uh, the future of what's going to be happening with uh, oil and gas industries, et cetera. And to the extent that there are benefits in terms of financial benefits, et cetera, those have a tendency to leave the state and go to where the headquarters of these, these uh, oil and gas companies are. So um, there's going to be pushback in terms of uh, the diversification of the economy. But the good news is that the same skill sets that are that people have from the oil and gas uh, industry, which are things like pipe fitting, welding, heavy machinery, uh, uh, design, construction, maintenance, et cetera, um, marine infrastructure, civil marine infrastructure, all those sorts of things are skill sets that can be adapted to the blue economy and to these sorts of blue infrastructure projects. So I would say, yeah, the, obstac the obstacles are sort of incumbent um, uh, if you, 
incumbent activities or incumbent patterns in how the economy works and the resistance to change of uh, things like opening up opening up the levee and creating new drainage patterns. And that means a shift in lifestyle for people who may be used to a, in some cases, a saltwater uh, uh, fishing and, uh, you know, shrimping, oyster, growing oysters, et cetera. Uh, so shifts between saltwater activities and freshwater activities and how changes to the levee system and changes to the coastal engineering are going to impact those lifestyle changes. So as always, anywhere in the world, change is difficult. And that's why we have to take a multidisciplinary approach that includes uh, community development, community engagement, economic development, as well as uh, existing and new engineering solutions. Yeah, I've got a quick question about the community engagement side of things. I mean, we've talked about that with uh, Jatine and, and, and Sam in our previous presentations, just uh, in terms of building cities or places for communities to live. But I'd be interested to know from your point of view how that works. What's the consultation process like and uh, how to what extent are communities involved? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, I was I was glad I got to get on a little bit and hear a little bit of what Chatine and Sam uh, had to say, and and of course there are always uh, similarities wherever we are uh, in terms of what what are the what are the obstacles and hopefully the solutions for this sort of engagement. I mean, the good news in that is that uh, Louisiana, Southern Louisiana, and the coastal region already has a lot of great organizations and a lot of great efforts that are underway in terms of uh, cultural preservation and particularly with regard to, for instance, the African-American community and the, the, the jazz culture and the creative culture here and what we call culture bearers, uh, some of these key leaders in the, in the music community and the, the arts community and the festivals, which uh, things like Jazz Fest and Mardi Gras and French Quarter Heritage Fest and all of the little individual festivals that happen in these coastal communities. And again, are things that are at risk in terms of their cultural identity. So. People really value and understand those things here. So, from an academic from an academic approach, uh, universities have a number of different uh, institutions and community engagement groups that are already working uh, with communities. So, uh, the Deepo Institute, as a relatively newcomer uh, to the region, that's a lot of what we're doing right now is establishing those partnerships. And again, why the University of New Orleans and their uh, research and technology campus, the beach, is such a key uh, factor in what we're doing. Um, also, another good example is at Tulane, there's a new Department of River, Coast, River Coastal Science and Engineering. So that's another organization uh, we're lo looking forward to uh, engaging with. Um, and other uh, aspects of that, you know, architecture departments at Tulane, marine architecture and marine civil engineering at UNO. These are all in that, in that, that diagram, that ecosystem diagram that I showed. These are all the constituent parts because uh, the Deepo Institute by itself cannot hope to implement any significant change. It has to be a partnership between all of these public and private entities and our engagement strategy and uh, what we feel good about so far in the last year is our ability to start to convene the, if you will, the self-identified groups uh, that are really willing and ready to make, in some cases, these difficult and even painful uh, changes, but are ready to do that work and, and dive into it and already have some experience and are already connected with some of the unofficial mayors, the community leaders, the culture bearers that, that are working to preserve and look to the future for uh, the ad identity of the region. No, that's great. Thank you, Greg. I think I agree, it's, it has to be collaborative. Um, it's not just about the individual, it's about communities and people coming together and actually trying to change things. Um, we've got one question, actually, an audience question about floating cities. Um, this may relate to your work with Seasteading Institute, because um, obviously there's been some criticism about this idea of having floating cities. And um, the question is about whether it uh, could be realized. Is it practical or is it a utopian dream, so to speak? <laughs> well, how much time do we have? Can I have another two hours? 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, thank you for the question. Uh, so the um, the evolution of the work at Deeplo Institute, I mentioned the uh, UIX Global Urban Innovation Exchange. And very briefly, uh, UIX Global was asked to engage with the Seasteading Institute on this project that I mentioned in French Polynesia, where uh, the Seasteading Institute was seeking to build the, the first uh, prototype floating city. Um, that project it was not realized uh, in, in part, in my opinion, because of some of the focus on the special economic zone, free trade zone sorts of ideas that are also a part of the, uh, the, the uh, Seasteading's uh, work that they do. So really part of the, 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 the concept or the genesis of the Deep Blue Institute was to really focus on just the blue, the blue infrastructure, the regenerative marine technology, which is sort of the engineering side of the, uh, the Seasteading Institute's uh, work and the global community, there's a global community looking at these sorts of solution sets. So in the meantime, one of the most promising and interesting projects that uh, the, the listener who asked the question can check into is with the Dutch Port Authority, which is building uh, in, in cooperation with the Maldives, the government of the Maldives is building a floating city prototype for a couple thousand people. Um, so these things are moving forward. They are realistic. The reality is that the Dutch uh, have been building floating communities, floating architecture. Uh, I mentioned Blue 21 has uh, built floating community centers, conference centers uh, in Holland, in Rotterdam. So they're based out of Rotterdam. So there's lots of examples. There's nothing new about this. There's, uh, so there's a scaling question. Uh, can it be scaled around the world? Fundamentally, uh, at the Deep Blue Institute, we believe that this is realistic and not, and it's realistic in doing it in a regenerative and positive way that, uh, that we're imagining communities along the coastline that are uh, floating communities that are engaged in economic activities like mariculture and aquaculture, but also fundamentally some of the technologies that the Sea Setting Institute uh, supports and talks about in the future is basically these floating cities parked off the coast of existing land-based cities and actually taking um, uh, the pollution that is being released, the sewage, et cetera, that is being released by those communities and doing what Buckminster Fuller characterized as pollution is just a resource that we have not yet realized how to uh, take advantage of, that these coastal, these, uh, coastal cities are in partnership with their floating counterparts and they are absorbing nit harvesting nitrates and phosphates that otherwise might do harm to the environment and using those in the context of aquaculture, mariculture, and uh, fish farming, et cetera. So uh, we very much believe that a floating infrastructure, floating communities are possible. In the case of these communities that are being lost, this is the communities that are being impacted by this loss, uh, foot, losing a football field of land every hour and a half along the coast. Uh, Plaquemine Parish, which is the final parish where, uh, where the Mississippi empties into the Gulf, uh, has already lost 50% of its land mass. So they've lost a major high school. Uh, so that means that the high school where your parents went to and your grandparents went to doesn't exist anymore. So these are huge cultural dislocations. And the only really adaptive solution, if you want to keep those people in that location and preserve that culture, is to build some sort of floating infrastructure or on stilts or something that can remain in place. So this has to be a part of what we're looking at in terms of coastal communities. It is realistic, the engineering has already been solved and it's really just a question of scaling and uh, distributing those technologies to different parts of the world. Uh, think the Bangladesh Delta, uh, think, uh, you know, French Polynesia's, the Seychelles, the Maldives, they need these technologies and uh, it's incumbent upon us to develop those. I had to actually Google how large a football field is, <laughs> but uh, uh, it's substantial. So um, how aware is the general public about this uh, issue? So 
I guess, a football field every 90 minutes. This is a slogan that everybody could understand, though. What, what is the general public discussion about? Yeah, well, you're, you're right on the money. Uh, that, uh, that statistic came out of a study from a number of years ago uh, and it's certainly accurate. Uh, the reality of it is it's when you, when you calculate all of the erosion, you think about, think about that as a thin line all along the, the coast. But in reality, what it means is that when you take the accumulated land loss each year from uh, points of very pointed erosion in specific areas, flooding, um, uh, loss of uh, uh, areas that may even be farther inland, that that is sort of the total that then is being lost on a yearly basis. It is a statistic that again, as you're saying, is often used here and in explaining the realities of what goes on here. Many people locally have heard it and it certainly makes an impression on them. But in my opinion, the real sort of um, reality check or the, the what people are facing is much more personal. So what's happening in Lafouche Parish right now post Ida and the fact that they can't rebuild the power grid, that so many homes are lost, uh, that uh, areas areas like Grand Isle that were completely wiped clean. It's another coastal island area uh, near New Orleans. It was completely completely leveled uh, for Ida. Uh, they were left with four feet of sand after the storm. So those are the the real life and personal stories that make an impact here with the community and they can relate to whether it's happening to them or to a family member or to a friend. Uh, the recreation areas, uh, and even relating back to some of the, the idea of floating infrastructure, a lot of people have fish camps here. So you go to your house on the coast or, or your houseboat, et cetera. Those are things that get particularly hard hit uh, in these storms. So sure, that statistic it catches people's attention, but there's lots of other things that on an individual basis people know about here. And as it relates to our work, um, it's something that this goes way beyond politics or constituency. People understand this is real, this is really happening. And regardless of your politics, we need to work together to do something about it and to face the future. And that statistic is just one of the ways that we uh, un un underscore uh, the and, and really simplify uh, what is a very complex problem. Okay, thank you so much, Greg. Um, I think because we uh, are going to have to wrap up our workshop this afternoon slightly earlier than anticipated, I just want to ask um, before we move on to our very short little break uh, before John's presentation, um, are there any other questions from, from the audience online or in person? Yeah, and again, Flora, I'm very happy to follow up with anybody. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, we'll, we'll make sure that the PowerPoint and this presentation is all online with your details if you're happy to just contact you and um, that would be great. Um, okay, so I'll just check, check the chat. Many thanks, Greg. No, this was, uh, okay, <laughs> many thanks. Thank you very much, Ulrich. Thank you, Flora. And, and thank you again to the, the Biennale and for the opportunity to be there with you. Uh, of course, I would have loved to have been there in person uh, and I'll, I'll hope to make it sometime soon. I'm way overdue. Uh, to uh, visit to Italy and Venice is always one of my favorite spots. So I'm jealous that you're there. I'd love to be there with you, but uh, we'll be sure to do that sometime soon. Yeah, brilliant. No, thank you so much, Greg, and um, we'll catch up soon. Thank, thank you. you again. Um, so to all our online participants, we'll just take a very short five minute break and we'll rejoin about five at 25 past, sorry, 25 past four um, here in Venice. And we will uh, pick up on uh, with uh, John's presentation, which is the final one for today. See you shortly.